let's continue the presentations with Dr. Dave Hewitt. Uh, Dr. Hewitt joined the Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute in 1996 and served as professor and research scientist until 2006 when he became the Stuart Stedman Chair in Whitetail Deer Research, which he held until 2017. He currently serves as only the fourth executive director of the Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute. His primary research interests include wildlife nutrition, ecology, man and management. CKWRI faculty have recently completed some cutting edge studies with practical implications for whitetail deer management. And we've asked Dr. Hewitt to share some of those with you. Dave? Thank you, Rick. Appreciate the introduction. And appreciate everybody being here um, through the symposium here. And, and we're so glad to, to be a part of this. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about some white-tailed deer research. And, and before the break, you know, Fidel had talked about quail. Quail and deer are really a couple of the main drivers for, for the wildlife down here in South Texas, um, including property prices and, and obviously the, the hunting and leasing and, and just a lot of the enjoyment that, that we all here in South Texas get from the wildlife. From a deer standpoint, a lot of the focus on management is producing bucks with large antlers. Um, you know, from a recreational hunting standpoint, they're desired. From a um, you know, lease income and, and hunting income standpoint they're desired and, and they're just beautiful animals and so there's a lot of interest in producing them. A lot of research over the years has kind of helped narrow our focus on what we need to do to produce these large antlered bucks and it um, kind of boils down to three issues. Um, we need to get those bucks old because antler size on bucks increases with age until you can get them up to, to five, six, seven years of age and then it starts plateauing so, so getting bucks up to those older age classes is important. And then nutrition and, and genetics are the other two aspects that, that help dictate the antler size of a buck. What I want to do um, in, our in my presentation today is talk about these issues in the rangelands of South Texas. And even going to get a little more specific than that, I'm going to focus on these rangelands in Southwest Texas, the area in the, in the red circle here. And you'll see in a little bit why that might be the case. It's a unique environment, just like any, any place. And, you know, in, in the white-tailed deer's range is gonna have its unique aspects. And, and so some of the things I'm gonna talk about may be real focused in this area, may not be broadly applicable, but I think some of the, um, you know, some of the principles and things we learned um, will give those of you managing deer in other areas some insights that, that hopefully will be useful. So to start with, um, age is probably the, the one um, leg of this, this three-legged stool that's most easily managed for Manor, or for, for landowners and, and ranchers here in South Texas. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the land is private. And so the landowner has control over which deer are harvested. So as opposed to, to lands or um, states with a lot more public lands, South Texas has an advantage that way. Um, traditionally, harvest has been relatively low to begin with. And, and so um, bucks are able to get to those older age classes more readily. And there's some, some um, tools in the, in the landowner's toolbox here in South Texas, like, like fencing that, that may enable them to, to keep, keep deer in, in a given area. The large property sizes also are a huge benefit. You know, um, trying to manage hunting across a whole bunch of 100 acre properties is very different than managing the harvest on a, on a 20,000 acre property. So private land and large property sizes have a big deal to do with the age. Before I get into managing nutrition and genetics, I want to take a, a quick kind of um, detour here to talk about the ecological context that, that this management is occurring in. And, and it's going to be really important, and you'll see why. If we think about the foods that deer need, there's two broad categories that, that we might think about. One is browse, the, the woody shrubs and, and their um, fruits and, and pods and leaves and twig tips and all that. And then the forbs. South Texas is renowned for having diverse and abundant um, browse, you know, and shrubs and, and woody plants. From a deer standpoint, this browse is primarily a maintenance food because of the, um, you know, the, the amount of fiber in the browse, some of the, the kind of potentially toxic compounds that limits the amount of browse the deer can eat. Um, 
and thorns, um, all these kind of things that, that maybe slow down the deer's intake rate. So all those things add together to make browse a great resource for the deer, but it seems to be primarily a maintenance food. It doesn't enable the deer to really maximize their production potential. If we talk about production in deer, we might be talking about things like fawns and antlers. And what deer in our environment need to produce fawns and antlers are forbs. Forbs are, are much more digestible, typically have higher levels of nutrients like protein and, and phosphorus. And so forbs are particularly important. Part of this ecological context in South Texas, and Fidel referred to this earlier in his quail talk, because it's so overriding for all the wildlife in our area, is that uh, the forbs are a function of rainfall and rainfall is highly variable in our environment. So you've got two pictures on the left of your screen, two pictures on the right. Um, the pictures on each of those sides were taken from the same vantage point, just in different seasons, or excuse me, in the same season, but different years. And you can see on that upper left, spring 2010, wet, that's as good a white-tailed deer habitat as you can find anywhere in the country. On that lower right corner, summer 2007 was wet. That's country deer might want to be able to raise a fawn in. You look at the other two um, corners of, of the screen, it's almost trawling desert. It's rough country. And so just dramatic swings in, in the habitat that's available for deer in South Texas. And this comes through in some of the things we might have an interest in and want to measure. For example, um, we've got a lot of annual variation in fawn doe ratios. So the particular graph I have on the screen here, we've got a 25 year run of fawn doe ratios from two ranches in South Texas. This Y axis is fawns per 100 does. And you can see a tremendous variation, lots of changes in fawn doe ratios um, over that 25 year period from almost total reproductive failure in the mid 80s here to fawn doe ratios that are as, as high as you could find anywhere in the country. 80 fawns per 100 does, you know, 80, 90 um, fawns per 100 does. So, just, so again, just like the, the rainfall highly variable, the form component highly variable, and that flows through into these, in these highly variable measures of production. Another thing to note, and this is important for managing deer in South Texas, this average fawn doe ratio for these two ranches, one's 31 fawns per 100 does, the other's 39 fawns per 100 does. And it's pretty typical in areas without intensive management to have an average fawn doe ratio in the 30s. If you went to other parts of the white-tailed deer range and said you're gonna be managing deer and have an average fawn doe ratio of 30 fawns, they think you're nuts. You know, they're gonna wonder if you're even gonna have a deer population. That's a low um, kind of average of, of fawn production. But it works for these deer. And just to give you some kind of context for this, here's some data from surveys done on a property um, of the East Foundation. The East Foundation has 150,000 acres south of Hebronville, so in this western part of South Texas. And it's a really unique situation in that it's unmanaged. There's no feeding, there's no deer harvest, there's no predator control. It's, it's actively managed as a cattle ranch, and so there, there's grazing. Um, and the Caesar Claybrook Institute's been working with the East Foundation to help monitor this deer population over the years. So here's a, a seven year run of data. This is acres per deer. Now one thing I um, want to make sure you understand, those of you who are, are used to looking at, at deer densities in South Texas, this may seem like a relatively high density. This is corrected for deer that weren't seen. So if you if we want to talk about um, the, the density of deer seen from the helicopter, it's more like 50 to 60 acres per deer seen. Over this seven year period, this deer population really didn't change. Uh, a slight uptick in the, in the overall um, trend, which means a little lower density through time, but, but this population is just sort of rocking along. It's not growing dramatically. And if you didn't harvest a population in Wisconsin or Iowa or, or Georgia, some of the Southeast states, that population would, its density would increase tremendously to a point where you'd have a real problem. This deer population doesn't do it. It hadn't been harvested in the last seven years, and it, it really has been effectively unharvested for several decades. Another thing about this um, the population, or I guess why this, this um, situation can maintain itself, is, is this low fawn production is balanced by two things. One, it's not low every year. You know, it's, it's high in, in those wet years, so you get these pulses of fawns coming into the deer population. And then the adult survival is high. That's going to be a requirement to have a deer population if, you know, if, you're, um, if your fawn production is relatively low. 
So this works for this, this deer population. And if you went out and, and wandered around this East Foundation Ranch and, and looked at the brows and looked at the forbs, there's not a browse line. This place isn't overgrazed at all. What's dictating this just kind of stand, you know, um, stable po deer population um, isn't that this deer population is way up against carrying capacity and there's nothing to eat. There's a lot of food out there to eat, but it tends to be browse. And only in the wet years is, is this good food there. And in the wet years, there's so much forbs that the deer really can't get ahead of it. And so, um, you know, it's, it's not a, um, a damaged habitat by any standpoint. In fact, it's really good habitat. It's just really good habitat in South Texas and, and is highly variable. So, back to our three-legged stool here. We can take care of age. Managing nutrition in this environment can be pretty tricky. A lot of places in the white tailed deer range, food plots are popular in southeast, upper midwest. Food plots are not a, a great option in South Texas. Rainfall patterns mean that you can't grow the food plots when you might want them, particularly in those dry periods. The soils aren't suitable for agriculture. If they were, they would, would probably be farmed. And even places with irrigation, food, food plots are just a huge amount of work in South Texas. And so, so you see a few of them around, but it's really not a, a technique that, that can be widely available to everyone and, and is something that would be easy to implement. Habitat management can be another way of, of trying to increase food resources for deer in this environment. That typically involves manipulating the brush with something like a, a loss and aerator here or chaining or root plowing and, and you know, to, um, reduce the amount of brush and make room, more room for forbs. Well, and that makes sense if deer need a lot of forbs. The problem is even with all this, this habitat management, if it doesn't rain, that's not gonna result in more forbs. The limiting factor on most places isn't the amount of open country it's, it's rainfall or not. And another thing, if you know, there's, there's gonna be some places where, where some brush management is gonna make a lot of sense, but it's not gonna make sense if you don't have a lot of brush and if your brush is, is real diverse, mature plant communities. Those are really valuable for the deer. If the area has been manipulated before and it's, it's heavily dominated by mesquite or weed satch, then, then some brush management is, is probably gonna be beneficial for the deer, but it's not gonna solve the nutrition problem. Managing density is another aspect to, man, um, to try to increase the nutritional um, you know, kind of groceries available for, for deer in an area. And in South Texas, this is, is not as, as useful a technique as, as it's gonna be in other parts of the deer range. Just like that East Foundation Ranch I talked about before, it's not increasing dramatically. Um, and reducing the number of deer isn't gonna make a big difference in the growth rate of that population because because it's not limited really by the amount of, of food that's out there. There's food out there, but what really matters is, is whether it rains or not and, and whether there's enough forbs. And so if you reduce the number of deer, um, the, the food resources don't change dramatically, which you end up with just fewer deer. So what a lot of managers of South Texas have honed in on now is, is managing nutrition through pelleted feed. And, and there's, um, you know, kind of some question about how valuable that is. There, there's, there's a variety of, of questions that come around, come up about it. And that's what I'll, I'll focus here on, on the present, rest of the presentation shortly. So what about managing genetics? Those of you who were um, on yesterday's portion of the symposium and, and saw Greg Simon's presentation, he showed a, a continuum of deer management practices from low intensity to high intensity. And a lot of the things out on the right-hand side of his continuum were high intensity techniques to manage genetics. I'm not gonna mess with any of those. What, what we're interested in, Cesar Claver can do is, is management techniques for free ranging deer populations. And really the, the best way um, potentially you know, available to managers to change the genetics of a deer population, a free ranging deer population would be to harvest those deer with smaller antlers. And then with the idea that they could leave the deer with with the best genetics out there, they produce offspring, and over time you improve the, the genetic um, potential for antler size in, in the herd. So with that, by way of background, what I'm gonna do is spend the rest of the, um, the, the talk here going over two studies that tested these approaches to deer management in the, the western part of South Texas. So improving nutrition through providing pelleted feed and improving antler size by culling bucks with small antlers. So the feed portion of, of this talk is, is gonna come from a research project that, that we refer to as the Comanche Faith Study because of the two ranches where it was conducted. 
Both of the projects I'm gonna talk about were huge efforts, big collaborative efforts, um, lots of scientists, graduate students, resources, et cetera. Um, so C Charlie DeYoung, Tim Fulbright, and I from the Caesar Clayburgh Institute were, were principal investigators on this project, along with Donnie Dreger from the Comanche Ranch. And what the, the kind of basic study design real quick of this research, you see it was in this western part of South Texas. It was a long-term project, so we had this project going for, I'm gonna present data on it from about a nine-year period. And we had the two different study sites, the Comanche Ranch and the Faith Ranch, each of those ranches had six 200 acre enclosures on them. And in those enclosures, we implemented some different treatments. The first treatment was a density treatment. So there were two enclosures on every, um, on, on both ranches that had 10 deer in them, two enclosures that had 25 deer in them, and two enclosures that had 40 deer in them. I'm not gonna focus a lot in the presentation today about the um, there's density effects. I'd be happy to talk with anybody about those later. What I'm gonna focus on is the second treatment that we overlaid on this. And this is that one of each of the deer densities on each ranch was provided with pelleted feed, what a lot of people are gonna to refer to as protein feed. And so those are the, the data we'll really focus on and talk about. Over the course of the, the nine years of this project, we handled the deer a couple of times a year, um, capture them with a net gun helicopter. Um, all the deer that we handled, we would place ear tags in them before we released them. That gave us a high proportion of each population that, that had, had ear tags in them. We'd run cameras so we could use those cameras and the proportion of deer that had ear tags to figure out the population that was in each of these enclosures. And then um, a couple times a year, we'd either add or remove deer to keep the population at its target. When we handle the deer, we take a bunch of measurements, including body sizes and antler sizes and things like that. Over the course of the study, we had some periods where we really focused on the food habits of the deer. We used deer that were habituated to people. Um, and that lower middle picture there shows one of our graduate students out next to one of these deer because they were habituated, basically kind of tame deer. They lived in these enclosures permanently, but they would let people up next to them while they were foraging. And so we could keep track of the number of bites of every type of forage and we could reconstruct the diet based on that. And, including things like diet quality and, and intake rates and, and all those kind of things. And then finally, the right-hand side of your picture there, we invested a lot of effort monitoring the habitat, the, the plant species, the, the shrubs, the forbs, the, the mast, um, and all, the, all the things that might be important to a deer and important to the ecosystem. And we had measures on them to, to determine the effect of the supplemental feeding and the effect of these different deer densities on the habitat. So a busy slide right here, but we'll um, take our time and walk through it. I'm gonna summarize the effects of providing a supplement on the deer. And this first um, kind of variable is fawn pregnancy rates. What this means is that a, a fawn is born in July, typically in this environment. That doe fawn has an opportunity if they have good nutrition to be bred before they're one years of age. So they may be six months of age, let's say, in, in late December or January, they may get bred. Um, and then they give birth to a fawn on their very first birthday. Again, it takes um, really high nutritional conditions for a doe fawn to get bred her first year before she becomes one year of age. And um, as, as you can see from our results here, this natural nutrition of the deer that were living on the native browse and in, in these enclosures, 8% um, of those doe fawns that we looked at were pregnant. I'll, um, you know, in contrast, once we provided the supplemental feed, those deer were eating the supplement and, and the native browse, um, about a third of those doe fawns were pregnant. So a big change in, in pregnancy rates of these, of these really young deer. One thing that uh, we came out of, of some of our research, we were able to use some genetic techniques to figure out who mom was on a lot of the deer that were born into these enclosures. And not only born, but, but got big enough for us to capture and handle and, and work with. And something that became really apparent, even in these supplemented enclosures where a third of these doe fawns were pregnant, they gave birth to their babies, um, you know, to the fawns, but we found very few, in fact, we may not have found any um, of the deer that were born into those enclosures whose mom became pregnant as a, as a fawn. And so even though these doe fawns are getting pregnant, they're not good moms and, and they just didn't do a really good job raising those fawns. 
Next variable down the list here is again a fawn doe ratio, so number of fawns per 100 does, the natural um, habitat or the enclosures with just the, the native brush in it, um, 44 fawns per 100 does, big increase in fawn doe ratios um, when we added this, the pelleted supplement. Um, survival of young deer, by young deer I mean from, from about 14 months of age up to two years of age, um, increased about from 62 to 87 percent survival over that period, and so that 25 percentage point increase by adding the pelleted feed. Um, adult survival increased, but it varied by sex. And so um, bucks increased from about 80, um, or about 78 to 84 percent, so about a six percent increase in, in survival of bucks. Does increased about 20 percent, from about 70 um, percent survival on just the, the native forage to about 90% in the supplemented enclosure, which is a big change. And then Clayton Wolf referred to this population growth rate earlier um, in the chronic wasting disease talk. He explained that a, a population growth rate of one means that population is the same this year as it was last year. So it's not growing, it's just stable. And that was the case in our natural nutrition and treatments. Once we added this pelleted supplement, that population growth rate went up to 1.3. That means that population is growing 30% a year which means that it um, a little more than double in three years. That's a tremendous growth rate on a, on a large mammal population. And if you're a manager, that puts you in a bind really quick if your populations are, are more than doubling every three years. Um, yearling growth rate had, um, this is kind of pounds per day of, of growth, had about a 30% increase um, in growth rate by adding the, the pelleted feed. Adult body weights, again, a difference between the sexes in this. This time the does really only were about a pound heavier in the supplemented enclosure. We can explain that real readily because they were putting all their nutrients into growing these fawns up here, the higher fawn doe ratios and, and the larger um, you know, growth rates of, of, of the fawns and you know, they also carried over into the yearling here. Bucks, on the other hand, um, 37 pound difference um, between deer that, bucks that were living just on the natural forage and, and bucks that were on the, the supplemented um, those enclosures with the supplement. And then we had about a 17 point um, increase Boone and Crockett point in antler size from the natural nutrition um, enclosures to those with pelleted feed. So big increase in antler size. Something else that managers may hope would happen by adding this pelleted feed and having it available in dry years and wet years is that you could take a lot of this variation out of the system. And that does not seem to be the case. So here's some data over the course of our, we, have, we get um, nine years of data here on fawn doe ratios. And the yellow is the fawn doe ratios from those supplemented enclosures. The green is the fawn doe ratios from the enclosures that only had the native foods available to the deer. And you can see, um, Adding pellets increased fondo ratios, but it didn't get rid of that variability. 2011, a dry year, fondo ratios come down. 2009, a dry year, fondo ratios still come down. Same thing with antler size here. Here's the antler score um, across those years and enclosures with the pelleted feed and enclosures with the natural nutrition. Again, 2011 dry year, um, still a decline in antler size. And this population growth rate higher when we add supplemental feed, but still variable from one year to the next. What this says is there's something out there um, that, you know, that this rainfall is still providing above and beyond the pellet that's important to these productive processes in the deer. Another concern with um, adding pelleted feed is that there's the potential for these deer to spend time at the feeder filling up on this, this pelleted feed, but you, they won't totally fill up. Um, deer still want some variation in their diet, just like we do. They're not only going to eat pelleted feed, so they're going to eat a certain amount of pelleted feed, then they're going to go out into the, the rest of the enclosure, or rest of the pasture, or across the ranch, and they're going to look for other stuff to eat. Well, if the pelleted feed gives them a bunch of time to go out and only find the very best foods out there, you could end up with a high grading situation where because of the supplement, the deer put extra foraging pressure on the very best foods that are out there like this hay flower or, or other forbs. Conversely, maybe this really um, high quality pelleted feed 
the deer needs something to balance that out and they need more fiber, they need something to, to kind of make it more like a typical deer diet. Um, and so maybe they really go out and, and they eat more of this browse to try to balance out that, that high quality pellet. So we were able to use our um, food habits data that we got from those habituated deer to look at, at what happened to the deer foraging. And I'm gonna show you some data now on deer food habits and just keep in mind, it's the vegetation portion of the diet only. So we're not considering the pelleted feed portion for those deer that were in the enclosures with supplement, but, but just the vegetation portion of the diet. So we've got this figure here. Um, let me just kind of get you oriented. We've got seasons across the bottom, spring, summer, autumn, winter. And then um, this is, happens to use the word enhanced nutrition. So this is the supplemented um, enclosures, and then here's our natural nutrition or, or no pelleted feed um, here. And this first set of bars are the proportion of the diet composed of shrubs, composed of browse, the woody plants. Those deer that had access to the pelleted feed, 45% or a little more of their diet was, was browse. The deer without access to pellet is about a third of their diet. Um, in the summer, again, deer with access to pellet had more browse in their diet than deer in the um, natural nutrition, um, same in the autumn. In the winter, we don't see that. Um, about two thirds of the diet of, of, of both deer with access to pellets and deer living only on the native forage was composed of shrubs. About the forb component, if we're gonna see high grading, we might see an increase in the thickness of just the green part of the bar here by those deer that have access to the pelleted feed, and we don't. Thickness of the bar is pretty similar here between the enhanced and natural nutrition in the spring, pretty similar in the summer, similar in autumn. A little difference here in the winter, but there were so few forbs in the winter, there's really no chance for the deer to high grade the, the forbs in the winter because they just weren't eating very much. Now deer that had access to pellets ate more shrubs, but they had to eat less of something else to, to kind of balance that out and, and have us add up to 100% of the diet. And what deer seemed to drop out of their diet was mast. So the prickly pear tunas, the mesquite beans, the grand henio berries, the wyacon fruits, all those kind of things, persimmon fruits. Um, deer that had access to the pelleted feed had left less mast in their diet than deer that were living on the native forage. You can see that in, in again, spring, summer, and, and fall. Then we had a variety of other diet categories that, that really um, aren't major. With one exception, it's kind of interesting. You get out here in the winter, and we had a, a big difference in, in this other diet category. The deer that had access to the pelleted feed um, ate a lot of dead leaves. And a lot of this was leached out, mesquite leaves that had, had fallen off the tree you know, after a frost. The deer were walking around eating those. Um, whereas deer in the, the natural nutrition enclosures um, during the winter, and this was late winter, you know, kind of February type time when black brush is flowering, those deer were really focusing on those black brush flowers. So um, the, the pelleted feed did change deer um, food habits, but they didn't change them in a way that, that high grading or, or loss of the best forages in the pasture is going to be a concern. So what are the implications out of this first study I've talked about? First deer in western South Texas are nutritionally limited. If you add a high quality food, everything about the deer changes. Individual deer, their growth rates, their body weights, their antler sizes, and at the population level, fawn doe ratios, population growth rates, all that stuff changes. So these deer are nutritionally limited in our environment. Secondly, the supplement doesn't remove that environmental variation. Again, maybe it's the forbs that are available in the rainfall, that's a really high quality food. Um, the deer are able to make use of that even though they have the pelleted feed and there's benefit to that. Those wet years tend to be cooler, maybe it's just a heat effect, but there's something going on in those rainy years that the deer, even with access to all the pelleted feed they'd ever want to eat, um, they still do better in those wet years than the dry years. And then supplement doesn't cause a high grading of the vegetation. The deer don't focus on the very best, best vegetation out there. In fact, there's some indications of the opposite. They might be out looking for fiber to balance out that high quality supplement. So one other implication that I think really need, needs to be taken into consideration if, if a manager is considering using supplemental feed as a management technique is that supplement is going to cause your deer population to increase. And so that's going to change your management. You're going to have to start harvesting does. You're no longer on a, a ranch like, like we looked at with that East Foundation that just kind of takes care of itself. Um, you've 
interjected you know some um, some management into that system and, and as a result other things are going to change and and you're going to have to start doing some doe harvest and other things to keep the population where you want it um let me go up here real quick so one other implication here um <clears throat> The study we did, if you think about it, was really an intensive feed study. We had one feed site for every 200 acres. And, and if you start projecting that out across a, a South Texas ranch of 5,000 or 10,000 or more acres, you start getting into a lot of feed sites. And we fed this food ad libitum, is that food is available every day of the year, every hour of the day. We did not quit during the hunting season like many ranches do. And um, you know, this kind of feed program is, is expensive personnel involved, there's going to be vehicles involved, there's going to be, you know, all the, the feeders as well as buying the feed. So, so that's another um, implication of this study that, that the benefits that, that I've outlined here don't come cheap. All right, so what about managing genetics? I'm going to move on to a, a second study that, that we've conducted and I was not an active part of this study. Um, it's a huge effort, lots of people involved. Um, Donnie Drager at the Comanche Ranch was, was one of the driving forces on the study. Um, Masa Onishi, Charlie DeYoung, and Randy DeYoung at the Caesar Claiborne Institute were, were also integral to the study. Mitch Lockwood with Texas Parks and Wildlife was involved, and Bronson Strickland at Mississippi State University also brought his expertise to bear on this study. And what we're going to be looking at is using culling as a technique to change the, the, the kind of the genetic um, potential for bucks in a population um, to grow antlers. And this study was, was conducted on the Comanche Ranch, Comanche Ranch out in this western part of South Texas again. And the, um, the ranch itself is 113,000 acres. There's three pastures that, that this, um, were involved in this study. There's this moderate pasture on the east side of the ranch, um, an intensive pasture, and I'll refer, tell you more about what this means, but just to get you oriented in the northeast corner and then a control pasture over in the northwest corner. And these, were, these pastures had high fences around them. So there was some control from a, a research standpoint on, you know, on the genetics and, and the animals in each of these three treatments. So the moderate treatment, again, it's 18,000 acres along the east side of the ranch. It's moderate because of the, the culling criteria that were instituted in that. And it was moderate um, because even though bucks were caught at random with that in, within this enclosure as part of the study, bucks that were aged at one or two years of age were measured and, and handled, but they were released. They were not culled. Bucks that were three and four years of age, if they had less than nine antler points, they were culled. Bucks that were five years old or older that had less than 145 antler points, they were also culled. So those are the criteria that were used in this moderate um, if we move then to this intensive pasture up here in the northeast corner, we now have the same coal criteria for three and four year old bucks, same coal criteria for the five year old bucks. But now this is intensive because we're bringing in some coal criteria on the yearling deer and two year old deer. Any yearling deer with less than six points was cold, any two year old deer with less than eight points was cold. And then on the control pasture over here in the northeast, excuse me, northwest side of the, of the ranch, all bucks were captured and scored, but then they were released. There was no culling that happened in that pasture. So just to give you a feel how this all played out, um, all bucks were captured with helicopter and net gun. Um, in the moderate treatment pasture, there was six days of culling that happened. Um, in the intensive, every year there were six days in the moderate. In the intensive, there was one capture per day per year. And in the control area, there was one capture um, each year. Bucks that were captured were transported to a central processing site. Um, at that site, all the bucks were weighed. They were aged by tooth wear. Um, their Boone and Crockett score was, was um, taken and recorded. And then some samples were taken. And, and one of the really important ones that we'll, um, you'll see why that's important here shortly was a, a small bit of tissue to get DNA out. So bucks that were above the culling criteria were given a, a little microchip implant so that if they were caught in future years, um, we would know which of those bucks um, they were and, and be able to relate their whole capture history um, you know, as, as one record. And any buck that was below that culling criteria was sacrificed and the meat was donated to, um, to users in the county who could make use of it. So 
advance here. Okay, bear with me here for just a second. There we are. All right, so the study um, went over 12 years. Um, over that time, there were about 11,000 deer handled. Like I said, a huge effort um, um, to, to be able to test this particular management technique. And one thing important about this study is there was, the study started with seven years where the culling was actively going on. And then they stopped culling after seven years, but continued to capture in these enclosures to see if this genetic change that, that you'd hypothesize would happen as a result of the culling would, you know, would manifest itself and result in larger antlers over time. So um, we had this, this um, there's some data here from this 10 years, the first 10 years of the study, first seven years to actually being the culling, 5,500 bucks captured. That was almost 3,000 individuals and then 2,500 um, recaptures of, of those, some of those original um, captures. Or about 1,300 bucks cold in that seven year culling period. And then another thing important, using that DNA sample, they had 963 bucks that were captured as part of this study that they were able to figure out who daddy was, who the sire was. So now we know something about dad um, because that, that buck had been captured and handled and measured and the offspring. That, that can be really powerful and we'll see why. So if we're gonna see an effect, uh, we expect it to be in this intensive culling pasture. So I'm gonna focus on that, mainly in interest of time. And in the seven years of culling in the intensive pasture, there were 375 bucks cull. A great majority of these, as you can see by this, this graph here, were in the yearling age category, 133 of them. And what this came down to is that of all the yearling bucks captured in this intensive pasture, 94% of them were cull. So it was an intensive culling. And it was only the best of the best that were released. And so again, you know, um, if genetics are really driving this thing, then, then it should be the very best deer that are doing the breeding. Something else happened in this pasture though. Um, this is a, a graph of the number of bucks seen on helicopter surveys in the intensive pasture. In that first year, they counted 73 bucks. You can see a dramatic decline. By the end of the seven year culling period, um, they counted nine bucks on their helicopter survey. Keep that in mind. Um, so in this graph, we're looking at the, the Boone and Crockett score of the yearling bucks in both the control pasture and in the intensive pasture. The control pasture is in green. You can see a little bit of a drop over time, um, but, but not dramatic. And if we're gonna have an improved genetics uh, for antler size, you know, these yearling bucks are ones to look at because they were all born as, you know, after the culling had started. There's no bucks, yearling bucks that would have been left over from previous years that, that um, you know, were born before the culling started. So, so there's some good reason to look at these yearling bucks. And, and these yearling bucks, their antler size over the, the course of this culling actually declined. So we've got a, a drop. Why do we have this downward trend in, in antler size of yearling bucks over the course of this study? Well, one reason um, is could be related to conception days. So again, the green is the control pasture. Um, went from a conception date of uh, kind of on a, a calendar year, the 366th day, um, and up to 368. So a little bit delayed, two, two, um, a few days difference, not a big, but over a week, delay in conception in the, you know, in this intensive control pasture. So there's, there's something happening here. And what the, the PIs, the, the researchers in this study thinks going on is, is there was a negative feedback loop set up. Let me walk you through this real quick. So as you saw from that one graph of buck numbers seen in the herd, this intensive culling resulted in a pretty dramatic decline in the, decline in the number of bucks in that pasture. This means there was a really skewed sex ratio, a lot of does for every buck. Those bucks couldn't breed every doe on the first estrus. So some does were getting bred on their second estrus. Delayed fawn production. So you get these late born fawns. Late born fawns end up having smaller yearling antlers because they just don't have as much time to, um, you know, to get big and, and get productive. And so tend to have smaller antlers. Well, if you have smaller antlers in this intensive management pasture as a yearling, you get cold. And so the culling intensity didn't go down like you might think if culling was working, you, know, you get more 
you know, the, the expectation might be you get more and more bucks with bigger and bigger antlers, so you have to cull a lower and lower proportion of them through time. That didn't happen. The culling intensity stayed high through the whole study, probably because these yearling bucks had small antlers. That exacerbates this lack of bucks in the herd, the skewed sex ratio, and on and on around this negative feedback. So that's probably why um, yearling antler size tended to dec decline as a result of culling in, in the intensive culling pasture. Something else this study was able to do, again, because they had these DNA samples, is they were able to calculate something called the breeding value. And the breeding value is the predicted estimate of worth of an individual's genotype based on the phenotype values of its offspring and relatives. So this phenotypic value is antler size. So if you can look at the antler size of a, a buck's offspring and its relatives, that gives you some insight as to what the genotype of that particular buck may be. In other words, how, um, you know, how successfully can that buck pass on its, its um, you know, kind of genetic material for antler growth? That's what a breeding value tries to capture. And we've got some, if we take all the, the bucks, and these are our bucks three years old and older, we plot their score, their Boone and Crockett score here on the x-axis, and now we've got the breeding value on the y-axis. And to show you how to interpret this breeding value, let's look at, at a buck here. Um, and just kind of for reference, the average antler size of all these bucks three years old and older in the study was 125 gross Boone and Crockett points. If we take this buck here, um, that's being pointed at. It's got a Boone and Crockett score of 188 inches. So it was, a, it was a good buck, good buck on any ranch. Its breeding value now was minus 14. So what does that mean? What we do to interpret that breeding value is it means you take the average antler size, this 125, you add or subtract the breeding value. In this case, we subtract it and we get 111. This means that this particular buck with 188 Boone and Crockett points, his offspring would have averaged 111 Boone and Crockett points. If you look at another buck, here's a buck with a um, Boone and Crockett score of 156, and that buck had a breeding value of zero, so its offspring would average 125 Boone and Crockett points. What about looking at the, the best of the best? We take all these bucks that have a breeding value of 20 or more. Um, so these are the bucks that really have the potential to produce you know, the biggest offspring. And we could look at, at two different bucks in here. We've got one that had an average Boone and Crockett score, or, or its Boone and Crockett score was 125. We have another whose Boone and Crockett score was 195. Tremendous range in antler size, but the same breeding value. In fact, some of these bucks with the highest breeding value actually were below the coal criteria for mature bucks. So um, there's, there, there's some implications of all that we'll get to here in just a second. One other question, you know, there is potential to change things that are, um, have a genetic basis. Um, and if you can select on the, on both the buck side and the doe side, maybe you could really make some headway. So why wasn't there culling going on, you know, um, to, of females to try to influence generational antler improvement? And the answer hopefully is kind of obvious. You have no idea what the offspring of each of those females is gonna look like you know, from an antler standpoint. You don't know which females produce the best antler bucks, buck fawn. And from our breeding value slide, you can see there's also a lot of slop on that on the buck side. Just because you look at a buck's antlers, that does not mean that that buck has the potential to produce offspring that, that have the same types of antlers. So both from a culling standpoint or from a leaving bucks out there in the landscape standpoint, um, you know, they, um, that, um, the buck's antlers that, that you're looking at may not be a good indication of, of that buck's genetic potential and, and particularly its potential to pass those traits on to, to its offspring. So some points here. Again, antlers are not equal to, to breeding value. And I think a lot of this is influenced by this highly variable environment that we're operating in here in South Texas. Another concept, um, a second bullet point, is that improved standing crop does not equal genetic change. What do we mean by this? I've heard more than once in talking to managers that, you know, yeah, we started this culling program four or five years ago, and the average antler size of our mature bucks is a lot better. You know, we've, we've made some big headway on the, on the genetic improvement on our deer herd. Well, if you think about it, the mature bucks are five years old and older, 
culling started five years ago, um, there's no way that any of the deer born after that culling started are even mature by four or five. Um, and so what really probably happened that these managers are responding to is that they didn't get an increase in the genetic potential of their deer herd. They simply removed the bucks with the smaller antlers, left the bucks with the, the best antlers, and therefore the average went up. We refer to that as an improved standing crop, but that's not the same as causing genetic change through, through culling. Another thing that happened that was really interesting, I didn't present the data, but I can describe to you really quick and easy what happened. Individual bucks on this study, you know, some of them were captured and released. Maybe they were above the culling criteria, maybe they were in a control pasture. They were captured again later. And so there's, there's a fair number of bucks that we've got more than one um, antler set that we have measurements on. And there was a, a surprising number of those bucks that went from a trophy one year to a coal the next time they were caught. There were others that were a coal in one year, but they didn't get cold because of probably where they, you know, they, they were in a, a treatment or a pasture that, that wasn't cold. And then later on, they became a trophy. They were above the coal status. And that really confuses this whole issue of what bucks do you remove for genetic improvement? Again, I think a lot of this bouncing back and forth between being a trophy or being a cull for an individual buck is due to this highly variable environment in South Texas. And it really complicates the, um, the culling, um, you know, kind of the efficiency of culling. And so there may be some reasons to remove deer, um, you know, population control and feed availability, things like that. So, so culling is definitely a technique that has its value, but I wouldn't look at it in this environment as a way to improve the genetic potential for animals. So just to wrap this up, um, South Texas, because of this low and variable precipitation, improved nutrition has a, a huge impact on deer. Secondly, culling is an inefficient process and, and may even be counterproductive in this particular environment. Um, with that, need to acknowledge the, the funders, like I said, this huge project, Dan Friedkin, St um, Stebbin West Foundation, both the Comanche and Faith Ranches. Um, on the Comanche Culling Project, Dan Friedkin and the Comanche Ranch um, really provided the resources for all that to happen. Need to acknowledge Dave Wester, um, a host of graduate students, over 25 graduate students got their degrees in this particular um, set of studies. Um, Wack Etzel and Matt Moore um, both were integral on the Faith Ranch and um, helping out on the Comanche Faith Project. So I think I'm probably out of time, but I'll pass it back to you, Rick, and, and happy to answer questions on, online. Thank you. Yeah, that'll be great, Dave. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, there's been about four or five questions come in, so if you would be so kind as to hop on the Q and A and answer those, uh, I, I would. We would greatly appreciate it, as I'm sure the participants would. So, thanks again for sharing those whitetail deer management implications from what is but a small portion of the great research and education you and your faculty and staff are leading there in the Caesar Clayburg. Wildlife Research Institute. Mm -hmm.